This is going to be a quick study on the subject of should Christians drink alcoholic wine? Should Christians drink any type of strong drink? Many Christians will try to use the Bible to prove they can drink alcohol as long as they don't get drunk. This really isn't about a lost person drinking because that is what lost people do. They sin. The main thing for a lost person to do is not worry about not drinking. His main concern should be believing the gospel to be saved. And then he can worry about not drinking anymore. So this study is for Christians. This is for Christians who don't know how to combat other Christians about the issue of Christian drinking. Many times Christians are attacked by other Christians and persecuted because they don't believe drinking is okay, but another person does and they get convicted when they find out the other person doesn't believe in it. So the first reason I don't believe a Christian should drink is because God told Aaron the priest not to drink wine or strong drink. Look at Leviticus 10, 8 and 9. It says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Immediately after you use this verse, the other Christian will jump up and say, Well, that's Old Testament. But wait, this was a command to a priest. And if you read the New Testament, you will see that Jesus Christ has made us kings and priests. Revelation 1.6 says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if he told a priest not to drink... And you've been made a priest, should you drink? He's made us kings, and he's made us priests. And this is what the Bible says about alcohol being for kings. It says in Proverbs 31, 4 through 6, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. So alcohol makes you forget the law, you forget your mor your morals, and you'll pervert your judgment. As the verse says, and it says, it's not for kings. You're a king. If you've, you've been made a king and a priest, you will do very stupid stuff when you get drunk. And that's why it says perverting your judgment. Ever heard someone say, I'm never drinking again? And when they wake up next to a complete stranger, they say, I'm never drinking again after, or after they've committed murder. Many people commit murder when they get drunk. Many times Christians who believe drinking alcohol is acceptable will deceive other Christians into drinking it as well. So the next reason I believe Christians should abstain from alcohol is because it is deceptive. It is deceptive because you believe you can handle it. You may hear some say, I know when to stop or I know my limits. How do you know when to stop and how do you know your limits if you haven't ever gone beyond those limits? Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It is unwise to drink alcohol. One of the things the book of Proverbs, one of the wisdom books, will teach you is to abstain from alcohol. Proverbs 23, 29 says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Ever notice how people who drink always end up in depression? Then they go to alcohol to drink away the depression? It is deceptive. It deceives you into thinking you will feel better. They have woe, they have sorrow, they have contentions, they're getting in fights and acting stupid around others. I've seen grown men pick fights with 12-year-olds when they get drunk. The Bible says, who hath babbling? Have you ever heard a drunk talk to you on the phone? You can't understand a word he is saying, he's babbling. He has wounds without cause because he is so drunk that he stumbles, stumbles and slips up in his own vomit. Proverbs twenty three thirty one: Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Ever heard someone say, don't touch the stuff or I don't touch the stuff? 
the better thing is to say is don't look at the stuff. Because Proverbs twenty three thirty two says that the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. The devil is referred to as a serpent. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And the Bible compares alcohol to a serpent. And that shows it is the devil's drink. Proverbs twenty three thirty three says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. This verse shows drinking alcohol will lead to acts of fornication and adultery. You will be full of lust. And when King Herod had John the Baptist's head cut off, he had been drinking and watching a woman dance. You mix being drunk and lust together. It amounts to very bad things. Habakkuk 2.15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So that verse shows that a man wants you to get drunk so he can see your nakedness. The Bible is so true. Why do most men get a woman to drink so that she will take off her clothes? Proverbs 23, 34 and 35 Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. That verse is so true. Even after they have been beat to death by, by their drunkenness, they will seek it again the next day. The next reason I'm against drinking is because I have a direct command from the Apostle Paul, which is, Church age doctrine, and it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Ephesians 5, 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Then many will say you can drink, just not in excess. But they don't understand any drinking period is excess. The excess is in the wine. One drink is too much. You say, how do you know? Because look at First Peter 4, 4. It says, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Okay, is it ever okay to riot? No, not even a little. The same goes for drinking wine. In First Peter 4, 4, any rioting is excess. And just like in Ephesians 5.18, any drinking of wine is excess. The excess is in the wine. It's wrong to drink it, period. The next reason I'm against strong drink is because God says woe unto them that rise up early to go after it. Isaiah 5.11 says woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. When the Bible says woe, that means something really bad is about to happen. In the time of Jacob's trouble, when the angel flies in the sky, he says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpets that are yet to sound. When God says, W-O-E, that means you better get right and stop what you're doing. And now let's look at some of the verses men will use to prove a Christian can drink a little bit of wine. 1 Timothy 5.23 says, Drink no longer water. But use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. What they don't realize is that every time the Bible says wine, it isn't always talking about fermented wine. It is sometimes talking about unfermented grape juice. People even today will drink grape juice to help their stomach. I doubt the Apostle Paul was telling Timothy to drink alcohol. Then they will take you to John chapter 2. Well, they really don't take you to it because they mostly don't know where it is. They would just tell you, well, Jesus drank wine, so me and him would get along just fine. And the wicked country singer, Thomas Rhett, would say, if I could have a beer with Jesus. These country singers are some of the biggest blasphemers, even worse than all these satanic rock bands. The country's worse. Uh, John 2, 7 through 9 Shows us where Jesus turned the water to wine. It says, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And so they will take John chapter 2, and they will use it to prove a Christian can drink alcohol. 
And it will say, Jesus turned the water to wine so we can drink alcoholic wine. He, or he, so the, the Christian, when he says this, is lying or he just doesn't know what he's talking about because Jesus Christ turned it into grape juice, not alcoholic wine. And now you're saying, well, you can't prove that because it just says wine. Actually, the Bible shows you plainly that there are two different kinds of wine. The Bible talks about new wine. In Isaiah 65, 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. So what's the cluster? Numbers 13, 24 talks about a cluster of grapes. So a new wine is found in the cluster. New wine is just the grapes, the ju uh, grape juice. And what about Proverbs 3.10? So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The presses don't just burst out with fermented wine. It comes out grape juice. So new wine in the Bible is grape juice. And in Genesis 40.11, it talks about a man, Pharaoh, drinking grapes that were squeezed into a cup it says and pharaoh's cup was in mine hand and i took the grapes and pressed them into pharaoh's cup and i gave the cup into pharaoh's hand he's drinking new wine do you know who would always accuse jesus of drinking alcohol just like many christians do today that would be his enemies and the people who wanted him dead look at matthew chapter 11 18 and 19 it says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Christians will actually use this verse here in Matthew 19 to prove Jesus drank alcohol. And that's blasphemy. The verse is obviously talking about what his accusers, accusers say about him. He isn't really a wine-bibber. If that verse proves he was a wine-bibber, then would, it would also have to prove he was a gluttonous. If you have the nerve to tell me that Jesus Christ was a glutton and a wine-bibber, do you know what you're saying? You're telling me he deserved the same fate as the man in Deuteronomy 21, 20 through 21. And let's go to those verses. It says in Deuteronomy 20, 20, or 21, 20, And they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is, a, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. To say Jesus drank alcoholic wine is a lie out of hell and is blasphemy. To say Jesus Christ drank alcoholic wine is to say that he was a sinner. And if he was a sinner... Then the Bible lied, and he is therefore not worthy to pay for your sins. And he wouldn't have rose from the dead if he was a sinner. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you're yet in your sins. And you are on your way to hell. So you see how wicked it is to try to use Jesus Christ to justify your dirty sin of drinking alcohol. But if you're not saved, then your main concern should be getting saved. To be saved, you have to believe the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Romans three twenty three says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ died. He died for you. He died for you because you're a sinner. He was buried and he rose again the third day. If he drank alcohol, he wouldn't have rose again the third day. He would have been a sinner just like you. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though you were a nasty drunkard, God died for you anyway. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were without, yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly drunkard. Uh, Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. All the drinking and all the times you've got drunk can be forgotten. If you'll come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and get those sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you want to be saved, realize you're a guilty sinner, 
realize you can't make it to heaven on your own, come to Jesus Christ and trust in what He did on the cross as your payment for sin. He is the only one that lived a righteous life. You can't live a righteous life. Believe on Him and God will take Jesus Christ's righteous record, apply that to your record and take away all your sin. But I hope that you will be saved and I hope this study's helped you.